the reality is what we're seeing has been most highly effective on the selling side is making sure that the house, while being priced appropriately is important, it's more about... It's 2021. Doesn't it feel weird that at what point do you stop saying Happy New Year? Um, for me, it's about by the third of January. Yeah, unless okay. I'm texting a client, right? And like, like if I'm reconnecting with, oh, so here's in yeah. real life, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, in real I life. stop saying it like almost immediately. But when it comes to reconnecting with people, especially from a real estate standpoint, like trying to like you know just touch base with them after the new year, because we get a lot of that. People are like, well, I'm not selling during the holidays, so get back out to me. Like I'll use Happy New Year through the whole month of January. Like, hey, I hope your New Year's going great. Just I wanted think- to see if you're still thinking about selling this year. I do it for maybe a week, but even intellectually, it feels weird. Like, Merry Christmas sounds cool because it's like, uh, you know, I hope you have a great Christmas with you and your family and your loved ones. Yeah. Happy New Year is just like such a dumb. Happy New Year. Like, I feel right. like after we scream it. What am I supposed to do with that now? Of course. <laughs> and it's one of those things that I feel like like after we did done yelling it at midnight 01. Yeah. I'm kind of done this saying it. This probably be it. Kind of done saying it. I'll make it. a pact with everybody in my life now that we're not saying that anymore. It's not going to tell you my new happy new year anymore. But yeah. I, hope, I hope you have a happy, new, a happy new year, though. Yeah. Whenever you watch this, <laughs> I hope you your watch. year is going well. But when in real estate, it's going well. In North Texas. Yeah. It's crazy out there right now. Where are all the houses? I see them. I see houses on the streets. Here's what you need to know about a seller, or as a, if you're thinking about selling your home in 2021, mm-hmm. you are in a power position right Very now. Very strong. I learned something from you the other day because you're way more on the front lines of this stuff. We have builders that are capping the amount of contracts they're writing at any given time right now. There's a lot of weird forces going on in the market because what happens is we already have very low inventory. We have mm-hmm. a historically low inventory right now, meaning fewer people are putting their homes on their market per capita in North Texas right now than any time that we've sort of recorded those statistics. So if you are a a homeowner, you have a big power position right now. We also have a crazy lumber crisis going on right now. Lumber prices have skyrocketed like over 200% recently. Mm -hmm. So builders' margins are going down because it's getting more expensive to build. So normally what happens is in a low inventory market, builders are like, oh, hell yes. Because they get to be the outlet. They get to go build more houses and service all the buyers who can't find resale homes. Well, right now, they're not wanting to do that. So we have this very crazy inventory thing right now where even builders are like capping the amount of deals they're going to do. So that gives people that actually, if you are thinking about selling, if you ever were, you got a lot of power right now. Well, I think the thing that from from a seller perspective, like talk about the new build thing for a second. Lumber, windows, trades. There's none of them, right? Lumber's really expensive. Yeah. Can't find any windows, and they can't find people to build the houses, right? Yeah. So what's happening is a lot of these builders that I've been talking to with some of my buyer clients have legitimately just been like, look, we're only writing six contracts this month. Or we're only, you know, we're, we're, we're only executing on so many. We got a wait list of 60 people, right? So could you imagine being in a position where there's a 60-person wait list and a specific community says they're only writing six to 10 contracts a month? You're, you're six months away from them even breaking ground because you don't have a contract on it yet, right? And what's happening, I think new construction was always one of those places that people would flee to when inventory would get a little bit tight. Because we haven't seen it quite like this, but we've seen inventories get really low in specific sure. markets. As a whole, DFW just doesn't have any inventory. And I will tell you that the people that I have seen who are selling have done incredibly well. We had a house the other day that um, went for over 10% of asking price. And I will tell you right now, it did not appraise. The buyer was willing to pay cash out of pocket to make up that difference. It's been one of the hardest conversations to have with it's people crazy. when we have buyers come and ask us, you know, because we have, you know, past clients and stuff that mm-hmm. I, I work with. And they're like, you know, what, what, what I need to do to get this home. And you used to be able to say, hey, you know, don't go too high because it's never going to appraise. And you didn't really have to worry about other people circumventing that. Because we kind of always held to, you know, we're going to maybe guarantee a certain amount, but we're not going to go crazy. Right now, we have people that are really not even caring about appraisals. They're going over asking price. And if it doesn't appraise, they're just making up the difference in cash. And they're doing it at all price points, like all price points right now, which is crazy. So, you know, I I think that one one of the hesitancies 
for people that would be selling is, oh, I don't know where to go. I don't want to overpay. Sure. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I would sell, but, you know, the, the you know, in the meantime, I, I got to go find another house. This is where choosing somebody who knows what the heck they're doing yep. is so important in real estate because that's like day one stuff for us. Well, there's just so many opportunities, I think, in the long run or in, in, the, in the short term while we're dealing with this. If you partner with the right agent to to get your home sold and get in the new house, because look, there, there's no doubt that we can't sit here and say there's a massive lack of inventory and then turn around, and try and convince sellers that we can find them a house in two seconds. Right. Like, <laughs> like cause what we're not on my other hat. Yeah. Well, what we're on, we're not, we're not gonna be hypocrites about it. Right. Like purchasing a home is difficult right now. You buyers in, in this market are really kind of taking it. And yeah. that's, and that's, that just happens sometimes. Right. Sure. The reality is what we're seeing has been most highly effective on the selling side is making sure that the house, well, being priced appropriately is important. It's more about accepting the correct offer that's going to put you in the right position mm -hmm. because we have can take advantage of something in Texas, which the seller lease back, which is one of my favorite addendum to add to any contract for a seller who has to sell and buy in order to help you facilitate that time gap that happens because from the seller side, you're also at the same disadvantage, right? You have a house to sell, so you have a contingency on your purchase. So your offer is not as sexy to the seller you're going to purchase your house from, right? <laughs> so all these things that you're taking advantage from on the sales side, you end up getting hammered on the purchase side, right? So partnering with somebody who A, just understands the nuance of the 10 page Texas real estate traditional like resale contract is hugely important because there's multiple things that you can use in there to leverage like the lease back to get your sellers more time in the house to go find them the house that they need, which is turned up in aces for me, the way this market's working out right now. The other thing that I, I guess the, the other caveat to throw in there is all of the things that you would make as arguments to be like, I don't wanna sell right now because X, Y, and Z. Normally those, those concerns are very valid, but they have to do with other on market properties, right? Like, yeah, if I have a home to sell and it's going to be a contingent, you know, my, my purchase is going to be contingent on me selling my home. Of course, I'm going to be at a disadvantage in a multiple offer situation with 17 other people, which is kind of kind it's of run of the uncommon. It's run 34 of the offers on one of our houses. Recently. Ooh, it's kind of run of the mill right now. Right. I get that. That's, that's true. Again, why it makes sense to work with the right professional. We when when you're able to run a business, you know, and this is not just a, a us to start to do an infomercial here, but. That's just stuff we don't even think about because the reality is we have systems and mechanisms in place to go find off-market deals for our buyers. Like literally the dude filming this right now. I just bought him an, I brought him an off-market buyer for one of his listings, his last listing he just sold, right? There's people that were looking for a house. This one came along. He came to me. I said, boom, match, one showing, wrote a contract that night, right? If he had put that home on the market, I bet you he would have gotten 50 offers mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Didn't need to do that, right? He got exactly what he wanted out of it. The sellers got exactly what they wanted out of it. I got a buyer in early with no competition, got to write the contract, made it happen, right? We are actively marketing for off-market properties for our buyers because that's one of the other things about sellers right now is like, you know, I, I get that argument is I don't want 100 people coming through my house right now. You know, we're telling people that we put their homes on the market right now, like if you go on on a Thursday, just go stay at a hotel on Sunday. That's exactly. Until Sunday because, yeah, because you're going to have people coming through in waves. And that doesn't work for some people, right? So if you're on that side of things and you're thinking about buying, understand working with a team that invests time, energy, resources, manpower, a lot of human capital and financial capital and going and finding willing sellers that don't want to go and necessarily be on the market right now, that's how you go find the perfect house for you in a low pressure situation where you're not worried about putting your home on the market, having a contingent offer and all that type of stuff, you know, that, that ends up making such a tremendous difference. And that's again, why there's just, there's a, there's a spectrum in this business of, of the benefits of working with certain people, I think. Well, one of the things too, give Jessica a second, we'll cut this part out. One of the things that I think is, is really important, too, and one of the things that I've enjoyed the most in the last three years of just being in partnership with the team and having extra leverage is exactly what you're talking about. Our ability to go find off-market deals. I did this. I've, I've got one where the lady does not want to do any open houses. She doesn't want to show it at all. She wants to put it on the market at, 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 at a good price, but not an overly aggressive price. She wants to show the house for three and a half days, and she wants to be done. 
right? So if we're having those types of conversations with seller, we're setting up your game plan in order to maximize your money, to reach all of your goals in those three and a half days and then be done. Does that mean she's going to get the most money possible to squeeze every bit of juice out of it? Maybe, maybe not. But the reality is she's kind of going to make a pretty decent amount of money on her investment anyways that she's happy with. And at the end of the day, I think sellers have to realize, yes, is there an opportunity for you to make a little bit of extra money in this market? Certainly there is, right? Buyers are acting a little bit crazy. They're doing some extra stuff. You need to decide whether or not that's what helps you reach your goals, too. Because one of the things that I, I've found from walking in a ton of living rooms and talking to a ton of sellers specifically recently, because while inventory is low, a lot of people still want to talk about selling. They like the idea of selling, sure. right? And one of the conversations I'm having the most are people just wanting to push the envelope all the way to the edge of the table. And why I respect that, I'm a regular person, I'm trying to save money, I'm trying to make as much money as possible, I'm doing all the same things everybody else is doing. The reality is if that hinders you from going to the next step, we need to have a really serious conversation about what your goals are. And I'm, I'm finding that a lot of sellers aren't necessarily so interested in their money, they're intrigued by the market and, and the opportunity, but they're not really so interested in getting that fifteen twenty thousand dollars of list price all guaranteed no problems right because like here's the other thing and i think this is why representation matters a lot there's a lot of nuance when you have 34 offers coming in that the net number may not be the only thing that's most important to you right it, it's probably not the most important thing in a lot of contracts it rarely is and when i tell buyers like hey here's the deal it's it's really important for you guys to you know for you to present the best offer, that best offer isn't always dollar amount, right? If I know the seller needs to stay in their house for an extra 30 days, and I have a buyer who has that flexibility, that's a that's hugely important for me to know on the buy side. So if you're the listing agent on a, on a property and you understand all the buyer's wants and needs, and you have a ton of offers, you can tailor that offer in that conversation, especially with the seller's permission to go back and get them the offer they need that maybe isn't the highest and best as far as price goes, but if it's not off by some dramatic amount and we've got a, another offer that's putting way more money down, that looks more secure, that's that's giving us a lease back for a month for free, right? All of those things matter in the ease of the transaction because it's great when we're sitting at the living room table before any of the stressors show up to say, I just want money. The reality is there's a lot of stuff, especially in a real estate transaction, that people probably cut $1,000 checks for to make go away. In the escrow process that happens all the time. For sure. Half the time when you negotiate repairs and things like that, it just ends up being a credit where you're just like, what is the amount of money that I can amicably get away with just not having to deal with this, right? So people are, money it pays for convenience a lot too. What do you think in this market, what are what are sellers, what are questions sellers should be asking their agents prior to, to listing with anybody? Ooh, that's a good one. I don't think the questions change necessarily. Um, I think, you, oh, that's a good one. I think they do change in the sense that, look, you're going to get offers now, yep. right? You're, you're going to yeah, getting get offers is not the problem. Right getting now. offers is not the problem. I, I, I honestly, if I was a, a savvy uh, homeowner interviewing real estate agents right now, I would probably grill them a little bit on the difference between different offers. I really would. I would ask them, how are you going to make sure that I maximize? Not my money necessarily. Money is usually a big goal, but some people could prefer timeline is a big goal for people, right? I want to lease back or things like that. I think that uh, grilling your agent a little bit on the differences of the different components of different offers, you'd be amazed at, uh, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of college football coaches not knowing the rules. Um, <laughs> right. When you ever see... You ever see just like somebody doing something super bonehead with time management or something yep. in the fourth quarter? And it's because it's true. Like you can get to a certain level and still have some gaps in your game. And real estate agents are no different. You can have even solid real estate agents that are a little bit out of their depths in certain situations, right? And if you have never been, you know, having to run a two minute drill and all of a sudden, you know, something happens and you got to pull something out of your butt, you know, uh, you, you might be a football coach that kind of drops the ball. Or same with a real estate agent. Yep. I would, they, this is probably a market in which a lot of operators have never operated. I would grill them on the differences between, hey, let's get 10 offers. Or if we get 10 offers, tell me what the differences are that I need to be looking for. What are the most important components right here? So I know that I'm getting the best offer for my goals personally. It's funny that you kind of bring that up because that's exactly where I wanted to go. You said it a little bit differently. For me, it's that contractual nuance, right? Like, the contract itself is a certain amount of paragraphs, and I can just tell you as somebody who just works in this industry, there are very few agents who understand that thing from beginning to end, right? Paragraph to paragraph, beginning to end. They just don't. Understanding where the outs are, because here's the thing as a seller in this market, you have all of the leverage until you don't. And the second you don't have the leverage is as soon as you go under contract. If my understanding is right, I think there's somewhere 30-ish 
ways that the buyer can terminate the contract in the state of Texas? It's well into double digits. There, there are a ton of ways for the buyer to get the contract. It's a very buyer-friendly state. So while you, the seller, that's really great for you to get all the money. The listing agent sits in your living room and tells you they're going to bring you all this money. The reality is once you get under contract, you're at the mercy, not of the buyer, but really of the contract, which is a buyer-friendly document yeah. in the first place. So having an agent, A, who understands what your power positions are in there, also understanding how the offer that the buyer presenting plays into your power positions or, or, or protects them, right? That's why we say things like down payment, higher levels of earnest money, shorter option periods, right? No home warranties, all of those types of things that typically will jam up the process somewhere, eliminating all of those, eliminating as many of those as possible. And on top of you get the most money and appraisal guarantees and those things that are really easy to determine. Some of those other things that may not matter when you sign the contract, when you've got 30 contracts lined up and you're looking at one and it's got these couple of little points, those are the ones that come back to bite you in the butt, right? The the third party financing addendum time being 24 days. Yeah. And that buyer terminating on day 23, yes. right? When in reality, in a market like this, you shouldn't be giving that long of a time frame. So I think there's so much contractual nuance that most agents are really unfamiliar with. And by default, the consumer is unfamiliar with because why wouldn't they be, right? That's not their job to understand the contract. That's, That's why literally they why they're willing to pay certain percentages in order to hire somebody else to yeah. do it, right? Yeah. So understanding the contractual nuance is, is, I think, right now more paramount than anything else. And it's really what's allowing super savvy listing agents. because. Here's what I want to say. I'm going to sit in your living room and tell you the same thing. I'm going to show you how we're going to market it. I'm going to show you the pretty photos. I'm going to show you all the really cool stuff we're doing. I'm also going to tell you that in a market like this, if we price your home correctly, none of that matters because we're probably not going to get a chance to do it anyways because your house is going to be under contract by Sunday. Right. Right. So if I'm having that conversation with somebody, where can I really stand apart? Right. Because everybody's going to sit there and say how attractive their marketing is, how great they are. It's literally, and I've been, I've done this on my last three weeks, boys. I printed out the one to four family contract and sat down with them and showed them where the pitfalls are in the contract that they may not see right now. But these are your problem points when you're the seller. If these particular terms become an issue, this is where the buyer has all the leverage and you are stuck and at the mercy of the buyer. And that's been highly effective. It's been highly effective. And it's just, we see it every day due to the, I would, not even just the lack of understanding of all the outs in the contract and all the really important parts. Like even during negotiations, repair negotiations, things like that, you know, this, I don't want this to just become a bag fest and other agents, but some of the verbiage and things that we see get sent over to us is just like, it's ghastly. You know, where I mean, we're like, you're putting your clients in a very, very precarious situation here with the way that you're representing them. This, knowing the actual negotiation and contractual side of things down like a, like, like a lawyer is very, very paramount. Well, and I think, and, and I'll out myself right here, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a high school graduate with some college, right? The reality is I'm not going to, to write language in the contract that is vague in any way. We are asking for mm -hmm. a very specific thing, especially on the buy side. So now imagine this, you're on the seller side and you get some uh, repair amendment that just says um, repair HVAC, yeah. right? Some big major mechanical and has some very vague, and you're like, okay, cool. Well, that's fine. It seems like it might have an issue. And then you come to find out that it's not repairable for whatever reason. It needs to be fully re fully replaced. Yep. Well, if your agent doesn't understand that language, you are legally on the hook now. Tough nuggies. For $5,000 potentially worth of repairs, right? Which all of that stuff just goes into representation. And this stuff doesn't change whether the market's hot or not. I mean, th this is all important. You should want your agent to know this stuff. Of regardless. course. <laughs> it just becomes increasingly important when any any agent, I almost called him a name, which I shouldn't do, right? Mm -hmm. When any real estate agent in the world can put a sign in the yard and probably get you some offers, yeah. it's are they getting you the offers that allows you to reach your goals the most efficiently, right? And I think that's the type of thing that people need to be on the lookout for right now. Because I will tell you, putting a sign in the yard and taking pictures, anybody can do that right now. Keeping deals together and keeping deals running smoothly, especially right now, we've got you know, I'll say, I don't know if I don't think they're doing it on purpose, but appraisals are counteracting. Appraisers are typically conservative by nature and the market's aggressive it's and weird. they're trying to help balance that back out. It's a weird turf war start. It's a very strange turf war. Appraisers fishtail a little bit. <laughs> it's like they're willingly trying to push things back down. Like, yep. Get back in your cage. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and I just, I just, like I said, I just think there's so many people out there who don't really understand all of the, the back end part of just how important the contract is. And I'm finding that that's been the thing that's, that matters the most in keeping deals together right now.